almost 100 people in already, so why don't we, why don't we get started? Um, welcome, everyone, to this uh, LEAP webinar. We have um, some fantastic uh, folks to talk to in this, in Canada, a post-election moment where there's been a lot of mobilizing from social movements getting into the electoral game uh, to differing degrees and in different ways, but men, much more than we've seen in some time. And we have the um, great pleasure of having friends and comrades in other countries who are also working at this intersection of electoral and movement energies and, and spheres. And so we thought this would be a really interesting time to, to bring folks together. Let me introduce everybody to start with. Um, first of all, uh, my Leapista comrade, James, is going to be keeping track of questions and doing tech support and generally helping me muddle through. Hi, James. Good evening. He's mutedly saying hi. Um, and in Ottawa this evening is Matthew Green, who is a newly elected member of parliament for the New Democratic Party of Canada and has just been doing orientation in Ottawa. Hi, Matthew. Good evening and, and shout out to everybody, the 91 folks who jumped online tonight. There the you organizing go. starts now. Um, Marianella D'Aprile is uh, with the Democratic Socialists of America on the National Political Committee. You're in Chicago, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Happy, Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. And Emma Reese is a co-founder of Momentum UK, the uh, game-changing group that helped elect Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party in the UK, and is going into its second fully mobilized uh, general election in the UK. As of yesterday, Emma, oh my God. <laughs> Why are you doing this? What do you want to do with us? It's been a busy day. It has been a busy day. But it's great to be here with you all. Great. So um, this is a unique moment in Canada. We had an election. It was a very weird campaign that started with revelations of the prime minister in blackface and brownface and featured a late surge by our leftish party, the NDP, um, that ended up with a hung parliament, a minority government, with two parties that can function as holding the balance of power. So the Liberals now have two dance partners to, um, to pass legislation. And of course, the very first signals from Trudeau's returned minority was not humbled at all, but he reaffirmed that his first measure will be a tax cut, so more neoliberal policy, and reaffirmed that the uh, Trans Mountain uh, expansion in the pipeline will be built come hell or high water. So govern, running from the left and governing from the right, which is a story that is about 150 years old in Canada. Um, but what was different about this campaign from my vantage point was how many um, folks who normally do community organizing, uh, issue organizing, life and death organizing in communities um, actually got involved uh, uh, in really organized ways. And so now post-election, there are questions about what next, how do people keep up the momentum, where do they plug in next, how do we take advantage of this moment in Canada that might be a year and a half or two years or three, uh, but a shorter government most likely that might be vulnerable to pressure from the outside, particularly the NDP might be susceptible to uh, movement influence. And how do we actually uh, instrumentalize some of the organizing capacity that decided to visit electoralism uh, during the campaign and now is deciding where to go and what to do to try to push for especially transformative change in the face of rising fascism and racism, the climate crisis, and staggering levels of inequality. So that's the moment we're in broadly. What this is not is this is not like a mass organizing call where people who are organizing say, all right, I'm ready to work. Where do I sign up? Where do I plug in? That's not the service we're kind of offering tonight. We want to have a higher picture conversation, drawing in the wisdom and experience of people who have been at this moment before and have a lot to teach us. And someone like Matthew, who is in the midst of living it at the intersection of movement and electoral politics. So let me stop blabbing. I think that lays things out. Um, we're going to try to weave in questions from people in the chat and James will funnel them to me in different ways and, and I'll ask them to you. But let me just start um, by getting a little bit of background from you and situate yourself if you can for the people watching on this spectrum of full on electoral, I live and breathe the party, the party is my life, to you know, at the other end, parties are a waste of time, there's urgent community organizing that needs to be done and we think electoralism is a trap. And I know we're somewhere, all of us are somewhere in between those poles. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. And uh, Emma, why don't we start with you? As you're the person who just started an election campaign, probably has the most urgency. 
Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, as of yesterday in the UK, it's finally been announced that we are now in a general election period. Um, so we, in, in normal time or peacetime, which feels like a long, long time ago, we used to have elections every five years, like fixed term, we had fixed terms five years. Uh, but as with much of the world, things are incredibly politically volatile at the moment. Uh, and we've actually had, uh, since we had a, a general election in 2015, which was this sort of scheduled uh, election when it was supposed to happen. We then had a snap general election, which was called very quickly uh, in, with, with like a day's notice in 2017 because the Brexit impasse had, had um, prevented Parliament from being able to sort of move forward. And now that same Brexit impasse has driven us to the point where we've, we've got another election now. So we're, we're kind of all, yeah, we're all very much in election mode. And then, so me personally, I, um, my background is actually I'm a teacher uh, and I kind of entered politics as it were, very much as a teacher and I used to do social work and, and youth work and that was really how I thought I would go on to you know do make, make my make my contribution to make the world a better place uh, and it was really I was in the classroom during the worst impacts of austerity and it was at that time that I started to think god I, I I'm doing everything that I can but we need to change things at a bigger level we need to change things at a structural level and around this time in 2015 was um, when Labour lost the 2015 election and the Labour Party, which is our social democratic party, uh, his left ish. Um, so maybe a parallel with with the NDP. And it, at that point, there was a leadership campaign for a new leader and a social movement candidate, Jeremy Corbyn, who, despite having been a member of parliament for uh, for 30 years, had spent all of his time on picket lines at protests, fighting, you know, he was really a peace campaigner, so lots of time on international issues and at the forefront of the Stop the War movement and anti-austerity movement. And he was seen as a completely kind of ridiculous character. No one in a million years would have thought that he'd become the leader. But he put his name in the hat, uh, you know, threw his, his name into the hat. And within a three month period, there was just this huge explosion of energy where lots of people like myself, I would never have imagined myself being in the Labour Party before this moment, just flocked to the party and realised that there was this opportunity, this moment to really, really change things and to, to transform the Labour Party in terms of its practices, its culture, its identity, uh, and obviously its politics and its policies and to push forward a really transformative agenda. So Corbyn became leader of the party, myself and, and a few others then went on to establish Momentum, which was the organisation that grew out of uh, his first leadership campaign. And so over the last four years, we've been embroiled in this very up and down, kind of messy process of trying to transform the Labour Party, bringing kind of movement energy in. And the whole Brexit thing just exploded, you know, yeah. right when there was this incredible left-wing insurgency that that took over and fought a pitched battle for the soul of the Labour Party. It's it's like historically just brutal timing, yeah, that you've been completely preoccupied it, with Brexit in this period. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, we've all, we all feel for you. Because you guys but, could have already won by now if it weren't for that Brexit <laughs> thing. I do sometimes think, I wonder what the last few years would have been like if yeah. this whole Brexit thing hadn't been looming over us. But yeah. Um, Marinella, give us a quick primer for us Canadians about the Democratic Socialists of America and, and your work at this intersection. Yeah, so um, DSA is, um, I, I wanted to say this as you were talking earlier, DSA is not a party. DSA is, a, is an organization. Um, and um, it, it was founded in the 80s. It actually came um, out of uh, a merger of two left parties in the U.S. Um, or left groups in the U.S. So kind of like an anomaly in like in the general left to come out of a merger. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that ethos has stayed with us. Um, but for a really long time, DSA was more or less defunct. Um, really until around uh, Bernie Sanders 2016 presidential campaign when democratic socialism really started to 
uh, come onto the map, so to speak, in American politics. Um, you know, suddenly Bernie was um, not only like giving a name to all of the issues that people had faced, uh, were facing every day that had not really been addressed by politicians, but also, you know, kind of naming a solution. And so I think people started to kind of flock to DSA around that time. And then really the big surge happened after Trump was elected. And then um, when he was actually inaugurated, um, DSA just blew up. Um, and over uh, the period of about a year went from, I think, something like 5,000 members to 30,000 members. So this is like 2016 and um, 2017. Um, and so it's really, at the time, we, the organization um, started to have this kind of accidental relationship to electoral work and electoral politics wherein like a lot of members were being drawn to DSA through that um, by kind of no doing of our own. I in fact joined DSA um, around that first um, like early 2016 around that time uh, when things started to really um, take off um, with Bernie and then um, and then obviously later that year Trump was elected. Um, and um, it was funny too, um, Emma, listening to your kind of origin story, because I, um, at the time I was in graduate school, I was working as, I was teaching, I was like working as a teacher and a docent at a museum, and I also um, was trained as a writer, and so really um, kind of had that idea of like my role, and then when things started to take off, I happened to also have been before that super active in my graduate student union. And that was kind of the on-ramp for me, for DSA, for saying, okay, we, I know how to organize. We've been fighting for these things within the union. Um, here is an organization that has my politics, you know, um, time for me to join it. Um, but I guess the other thing, too, that I wanted to talk about is we have had this kind of um, incidental relationship with elections. The other big bump that we got was the AOC bump. We got 10,000 members in one week after she was elected. And um, so we've been really working on developing, you know, how do we relate to electoral work? And um, what we have been, um, the approach that we've been taking is one that we've been calling um, class struggle elections. And I can talk about that more as our conversation you goes must. on. That's a very fruitful phrase. Yeah, yeah. But basically thinking about how how do we engage in electoral work in a way that foments class struggle. Cool. Um, so is there a game plan for DSA to, like, do you, do your members work in elections in an organized way for left candidates? Do you plan to run candidates in the future? Is there a clear, it, 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 can you make it like more clear? Yeah, so it, um, so DSA is composed of about 150 chapters across the country. And um, the short answer to your question is yes. So we have kind of DSA candidates running for office all across the country. Uh, for example, now we have a, can a candidate, a DSA member, home, very, very homegrown DSA member uh, named Heidi Sloan, who's running for Congress in Texas, in the 25th district of Texas, which is very, very rural um and and uh red uh district in like the republican sense mm -hmm. and then for example we have so that's kind of like a, a big like up ballot race that we have um we also have uh, a crew running for city council uh, uh, or a duo running for city council and mayor in ferndale michigan on a platform called ferndale for all mm. um, which i think is pretty um exemplary of the kind of work that um, we're uh, aspiring to, right? Of running candidates who maybe are running for different offices, but are running on a shared vision of what mm -hmm. the world should be. And they're, and they're running within the Democratic Party? Yeah, so running? all of these are running within the, the Democratic Party. Here cool. in Chicago, we um, elected just earlier this year, six DSA members to um, city council. And city council is a non- partisan uh, race uh, in Chicago. 
And so um, the, all of these candidates were really um, kind of homegrown DSA candidates and we really took their campaigns really um, seriously at the same time that they were all um, super tied into like their respective communities and um, community organizations. So it was really a kind of a coalition effort that we engaged in there to elect those candidates. It wasn't like a DSA kind of only effort. Yeah. So it really varies across the board uh, that, how that we approach. Happen, yeah, that happens at the municipal level a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, so Matthew, congratulations uh, on, on your entry into the most complex uh, mission of your life so far. Do you want to tell people a little bit about your background, how you got to this place? And, and I'd love it if you could sh weave into it your kind of, because you're the only politician, uh, um, elected politician on the call, um, how you see the relationship between your electoral work and social movement organizing. Yeah, maybe I'll actually start there. You know, it's, uh, I think, a great lead in hearing from both the UK and the US in terms of where those interventions are happening in very specific ways and very strategic and tactical ways. Because for myself, I'm a new, new Democrat. I come to this very honestly. I share the cynicism of many people who are probably on this call tonight uh, in a lot of ways, for people who haven't been involved, it's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. No heart, no brains, no courage. Uh, but for me, it's getting to the end of the yellow brick and pulling back the veil and realizing that these big machines, whether they be, you know, liberal, conservative, or, or even in some cases, new Democrats, uh, is really just a, a, you know, a little man behind a veil. And when you pull that back and you're, out, you're willing to outwork people, you're willing to build broad-based coalitions that are rooted in community, that are rooted in building community power, you can win nominations, you can win ridings, and you can, you can actually uh, intervene in very meaningful ways. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. It's awesome to be on the call with everybody tonight. For myself personally, as I mentioned, I'm a new, new Democrat. I came through uh, city council, which I think is a great place to find independent thinkers, people who are willing to understand the needs of their constituents. And so for instance, in my community ward, uh, ward three, I would often say is to Hamilton what Hamilton is to the rest of the country. So when times were good, our working class built Canada. We have the industrial North End, uh, we, we, you know, are, are the heartland of, of unionism. We have a very, I think, proud distinction. They actually chased the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau out of our Labor Day parade. He wasn't invited, nor was he welcome. Uh, but simultaneously, we're dealing with very significant social pressure. We have you know, an average income of $43,000. 33% of our children are living in profound, deep poverty. Uh, for myself as a city councillor, the most haunting call I would get is somebody facing imminent eviction, recognizing that in our city facing like an incredible housing crisis, mass gentrification, we would have record building permits year after year with cranes dotting the sky with towers while simultaneously we have record numbers of people living in tents. Profound inequality. Mm -hmm. And politics, much like life, is about moments. And there is a moment happening internationally, as we see with the comrades who are on the call tonight, where we are facing the onslaught of a kind of chaotic conservatism, neoliberalism, extractionary capitalism that is, uh, that is costing us lives. Like people are, are literally dying by these policies. So I had a choice. Uh, you know, in the leadership of Jagmeet Singh, who is speaking truth to lived experience that he had around racial inequalities as really policing. I saw in somebody who had a courage to take on these issues that were not, hadn't been reflected, quite frankly, in the left and in party politics. There's lots of people who will jump to this idea that race isn't a thing and there's only class. And for folks who are living racialized, we, we know that not to be true. So, so he took that on. I had a decision to make whether I was going to stay on the sidelines and be critical of party politics and, 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 you know, whether I consider myself left of the New Democratic Party or, uh, you know, far, far left of the New Democratic Party or not, I had an opportunity to, to, to take that seat at the table. And there are far um, too few folks uh, that do have those seats that when the opportunity came, I decided to, that I needed to take it. And in doing so, create room and space for an incredible new city councillor who's uh, Narendra Nan, who's absolutely amazing, who's now taking on my seat. So 
Um, so it's about building, it's about building power with community, and it's about creating space for, for new voices and new leaderships and big platforms. Um, and, that, and that's what I'm seeing reflected in this last election with, I think, one of the, one of the most progressive. Is it, it, is it where we need to be? No. But is it one of the most progressive platforms we've had in a generation? I would argue yes. Mm -hmm. I would argue absolutely yes. Was it the most you know, diverse and representative slate of candidates that Canada has seen ever? I'm also going to argue yes. And they're still out there. And I'm super excited about the leadership that's emerging uh, on the left. And I'm super grateful to the interventions from movements like uh, Our Time. Shout out to them. In my first three hours, Abby, being in Ottawa, I, did, uh, I was proud to receive a group of, of comrades who did a peaceful you know, action inside Parliament Hill that were arrested and removed. 27 people, I think, who were arrested inside the Parliament chambers. On, yeah, uh, to the call. First, the the one, week, uh, one week after the, the election, calling for a Green New Deal as the first priority of the new government. Yeah, and, and it's amazing. And we're going to continue to need that in the minority uh, position. So now you couldn't we're... get your ass in there and get, elect and get arrested, Matthew? Like, uh, you know what? Like so, fancy member of parliament not going to go there? Yeah, you know what? So I'm here's just just no, no, no. But that's an interesting point. And then I share this with, her, with the folks who did come out is that Canada has a different context. You know, I am not AOC. There is no, there's not going to be, you know, an AOC type scenario happen here. We have our own unique context. We're not two parties. We're multiple parties and we're going to emerge in our own leadership. Uh, just so to sit in, you know, on a protest against your own party is one thing. To do it against government on your first day is, is, um, is incredible for the people who, who did that. And I think it was amazing. And I wanted to show solidarity by being with them uh, outside. It was, it was a striking image, like you out there with the folks who had just been arrested. This felt new as our time, which is a project of 350 in Canada, um, organizing young people, endorsing candidates, starting these fairly autonomous hubs that, that then really threw down behind candidates like yours. Mm -hmm. uh, like your candidacies like yours. So this is, the, this is where I want to move things. The big, big question is the, the what next question after the election. And Emma, you just have to sort of time work back or forwards um, for this one. But the real question at the heart of uh, movement interventions in, in electoral politics is, so you work your butts off to get a candidate elected and then they go off into the machine to be disciplined by their parties, to be constrained by the centralized control and the centrist politics. And then how do movements keep candidates who get elected accountable? What, is the, what are the structures and mechanisms what, beyond just, or is it just the relationships? And Marianella and Emma, I'd love to hear from you both on thoughts about how, what does the day after look like to, to maintain? We know what our role is, get people elected during an election that's really simple. But then after that, how do we use our power that we've developed in that sphere to actually make results happen? and not get just sort of ignored in between elections. Got thoughts, wisdom, either? I'll make one of you go first or you can jump. Because it's the hardest question, of course, that I ask first. All right, Emma, I'm gonna make you go first. All right. Uh, I, well, look, there's clearly not, there's not one answer and it, there's also never gonna be, yeah, like one solution that then just works time and time again. It's an ongoing process. Uh, and on some days it feels like we're doing a really good job of that um, and on, on, on other days it feels like we're really really failing um, and, and the reality is that it's probably both right I feel like we are doing a good job and are making progress and we're also yeah at other points it feels like we're losing ground I think the key thing or one, one key thing is that, so I think it's, it's fantastic to hear Matthew talk about, you know, first day in office, like go and stand in solidarity uh, with, the, with the protesters. And it reminds me of, of the first day that Jeremy Corbyn got elected and he went straight out to the refugees are welcome demonstration, which is exactly the same thing that he would have done when he was a, a backbench MP. And he had all of the advice telling him that that wasn't appropriate and he went out and did it. So I think there's this there's a, a responsibility on the leader on the, the people who are elected, the leaders in office, to carry on that connection and that interaction with the grassroots. And then there's that responsibility on the grassroots to not suddenly like disappear into the corridors of power, but to actually keep like the strength of any of our elected people is the movement. 
that's what sustains them. And we've experienced many ups and downs of this over the last few years. Any time when, when Jeremy and the, the team try to play parliamentary politics, like try to play by the rules, they're, they're not that good at it, to be frank, right? They're, <laughs> they're, they're not that good at it. And sometimes there've been certain moments where they've tried and we're all just like, what are you doing? This, you're never going to win playing their game. Yeah. You are going to win playing our game, right? right? And it's always in those moments. So keeping that dialogue, keeping that connection, a lot of it, it well, some of it is relationships. Another thing is about developing, we've really had this concept of the ecosystem, right? The, the ecology of the left where the Labour Party is like a, a one really fundamental, like key part of it, but that exists in this broader system. Momentum is part of that. We have other institutions, we're developing think tanks, we're developing campaign groups, we're developing you know, different parts. We're trying to build shared infrastructure that will support the left uh, you know, in, the long, in the long term, in the long battle. And I think that's the stuff, that's the building, that's the building power, just as you were saying, uh, Matthew, that feels really necessary to not just get swallowed up in the machine. When you talk about building shared infrastructure among uh, institutions that are make up an ecology of the left, I can feel people I, I know in the chat <laughs> getting really excited about that. <laughs> Marinelle, how do you take that? Um, not just the infrastructure of the left question, but the how do we maintain pressure? Concrete. Yeah, I think it's this question of holding um, politicians accountable is super interesting. It's been really, um, uh, we've grappled with it a lot in DSA because there are, you know, AOC, um, although DSA, uh, just to take her as an example, obviously DSA really participated in her campaign and she's a member and everything. Um, but it's not like DSA was kind of solely responsible for her, her victory. Um, and there are other organizations and other ties and so the question of accountability becomes really difficult um, and so one way i think that's useful to think about it is to really root ourselves in the issues and the things that uh we share with a candidate or an elected that isn't just trying to get them elected but are actually our common goals um, so to illustrate that um maybe in a more um sort of obvious or uh, smaller scale way. And also, I think this gets to a question that was in the chat earlier. I, I lost it, it's like way up there now. But um, so here in Chicago, I would, like I was saying before, we now have six out of 50 city council members who are DSA members. And um, something that really we did to build up momentum for that campaign was that in late 2017, we started um, DSA, Chicago DSA was kind of still kind of getting its feet um, or legs under itself. And um, we were thinking, some of us who were leaders um, in the chapter at that time, we were thinking, okay, well, what should we do? What kind of campaign should we run? What kind of project should we take on? And at the time, there was a lot of energy in the city around a campaign to lift the ban on rent control. So since the 90s, there's been a statewide in all of Illinois uh, ban on rent control. And so um, there had already been a coalition formed around this in the city um, and some of our members were involved in it. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's go with that. You know, there's energy around it. Um, working class people are already moving towards this is something that it would be materially, just would really change people's lives if we want it. So let's, let's start doing that. We started running our own canvases and, um, uh, participating in the coalition. We eventually became leaders of the coalition. A year later, when we just started thinking about running for aldermen or running aldermen for office, um, we had already built up like a year, a year's worth of experience, um, a year's worth of knocking doors, a year's worth of like just getting FaceTime with people. We'd actually like gotten um, referenda on ballots and gotten really, really, really high percentage of yes votes on them. So anywhere I think the lowest percentage we got on a referendum that we put on the ballot for lift the ban was I think 68% or something like that. So um, we had built up this momentum and we had built organic connections to the existing movements that were also behind it. And so when it came time to think about city council races, 
that was kind of already like a natural connection that we had not only with Carlos Rosa, who was uh, who was already on the city council, but with other potential candidates. And so, you know, when it came time to go knock on doors for any one of our candidates, um, it was really easy because it was like, um, you know, this thing that we've been talking to you about for the last year, rent control. Okay, well, this candidate is going to fight for that. And then that becomes like the natural accountability mechanism, right? Uh, because that's a movement and that's an issue that we are building toward, that we're fighting for outside of whether or not we're trying to get that person elected. So there's a lot of interest in the chat in the municipal level, Matt, and you, Matthew, you've been there. Might have got a hotel room freeze there from Mr. Green. Um, how, how uh, so this is an interesting question in Canada where we haven't seen, we've seen within the NDP, people elected at the municipal level oh, and then that. being brought up to other levels. There, Matthew, you're back with us now. Oh yeah. Can, but we haven't can, seen the insurgent politics, the new politics of the last sort of four or five years manifest as much at the municipal level, starting to see it in Vancouver that passed a climate emergency resolution that wasn't symbolic, that had really big policy uh, demands baked into it, and that will really change the emissions of that city for one thing with a justice lens. But Matthew, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I had a good rant going there, and then I got kicked offline. So I think like the big Start thing from the beginning, me, all right? Yeah, yeah no, in, in my observation to build on but what both Mary and Ellen and Emma had chatted about is this idea of like, I have observed movements, particularly coming from environmentalism and not climate justice, but I'll say environmentalism specifically, where they're trying to endorse people after the fact. They, you know, they, they hope that liberals will do the right thing again. They hope that new Democrats will fight for them like they need them to fight for them. And I think the success that's inherent in what I've observed out of the DSA and momentum, which we're seeing now in this cycle for new Democrats, is that we're nominating people for movements. It's in our DNA. And with social media, the, the centralization of power and the control of the whip's office and the central comms is being eroded. I can go, and I've been doing this, directly to, to my people, directly to the public with my positions on certain issues as they happen in a way that is more dynamic and has greater velocity and is quicker and more nimble than any time before us. So this politics 3.0, you know, if we're going to talk about what the next cycle looks like in Canada, then the question is, how do we convert all the excitement and movements that have happened through folks like our time and lead now and others to actually nominate people so that you don't have to go to them and ask them to do the right thing because they are of our DNA and we know that that's just who they are. So I'm really interested to see what happens with you in the next couple of years, um, because there are disciplinary mechanisms within parties. You already referenced them, whether whipped votes in the House of Commons and staff around the leader and others who, are, who have been guardians of the centrist uh, uh, policies of, of leftish parties all over the world. Um, so when you go right to the people through a Twitter or Instagram video, with a policy that is far to the left of, of what the, the brass are telling you you're allowed to say, it's, it's going to be interesting, right? Well, I mean, I think it's the distinction now with social media. Again, Avi, if you look at how quickly Jagmeet responded to those youth, how the caucus is going to, you know, come out with those mandate letters and, and they're supporting it. We're not hiding from it. But at the end of the day, it's a question of whether or not we're the thermometer or the thermostat. And I believe that in this point in time, in this cycle, we're going to be setting the temperature on some things. There's no longer going to be an opportunity for politicians to ignore climate. That's done. And they got away with it this time out of fear-based voting. But that will never happen again. I promise you it will never happen. Um, we have a very active chat in this webinar. I'm loving seeing it go by, and I, I promise I'm not reading everything because I'm in the conversation. <laughs> but James is reading everything. Um, do you want to bring in a couple of uh, a question kind of group from what you're intuiting from the, the audience? Yeah, definitely. Tons of great questions in the chat. I encourage you to keep adding yours there. I'm going to pull together a couple questions here, uh, particularly from Mary, Jacob, and Lella. I believe I'm saying that right. It basically, how do we talk about and build support for what are perceived as far out and radical ideas, namely a Green New Deal? Um, and how do we change the political landscape so that these ideas become popular 
what are more conservative places. And in the Canadian context, like Alberta. And this is kind of a side question here for you, Matthew. How much damage did the ANDP, the Alberta NDP, that is, government do to this movement? And so we were talking a lot about this before, and Marianella was talking about the rise of the word socialism in the U.S. Uh, so curious to hear all of your takes on that. Maybe uh, we'll start with you, Marianella. Sure. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Um, just because I think in the U.S., um, and I kind of imagine maybe the Canadian like general context is, is pretty similar. Um, socialism had been this kind of dirty word um and maybe any ideas that were attached to it like abstractly uh were like kind of dirty um i think a great example of this like okay like far out ideas that then turn out to be like not so far out is medicare for all in the u.s um so for a really long time it was like oh my god single pair it's never gonna happen what are these people even talking about? Maybe in California, but like not even that, there's no way. And I think once, I think what made the difference um, to the point where now Medicare for all, you know, even has majority support among most Republican, registered Republicans in this country, is that um, was just really breaking it down, first of all. Um, breaking down the fact that um you know luckily we had a bill to go on but breaking down the fact that the base if, if we were to enact medicare for all based on that bill most people would end up paying much much less um than they're paying now for health care and then also making appeals to um things like health care as a human right um and the, both those things kind of combined so combining the kind of um, political imaginary appeal of what is possible and what kind of society we want to live in and kind of what kind of future we want to move toward with the kind of like hard dirty facts has really um, made it so that we've been able to move um, at Medicare for all away from being this like crazy idea in most people's minds at least in the media landscape and then obviously all of that kind of media work has to be combined with a lot of like um groundwork um and that's how in dsa that's how we built our medicare for all campaign has been by door knocking um for the last like three years and have built an really an immense amount of support for it um so much so that you know um we were able to just recently turn a, a congressperson in texas uh, from being really against Medicare for all to co-sponsoring the bill. Wow. I noticed Tim in the chat was talking about sometimes it, it's a question of messaging to like you're saying, boiling it down to core values, talking about, for instance, climate in terms of safety, the, the fundamental safety of people everywhere. Um, and, and whether that's a way to reach um, into rural areas, into conservative areas. Emma, what's your experience of this? Yeah, well, what you what you were just saying there, Marinella, like really resonated a lot with the experience in the UK. We have seen a huge shift in terms of the the framing and the narrative around austerity in the last four years. So, the Labour Party pre Jeremy Corbyn was a literally went to a general election with an austerity agenda, austerity light, and straight away when Jeremy uh, took over as leader of the party. The, like first statement was like this is an anti-austerity party mm -hmm. like we don't believe that we don't believe that we should be cutting public services because bankers collapse a financial uh, system so it's just like sometimes you know but it's kind of like once that had happened there was like some noise for about a day and then that just became the new normal it's like oh right because actually and i think at the at the crux of all of this um at the crux of this issue is the fact that actually the status quo position is really extreme. So we just need to point out to people <laughs> that like, if we, can, if we continue on our current trajectory, the world is going to become uninhabitable for human life. And it's gonna be really miserable. And our last years on, <laughs> on earth are going to be terrible. And it's like, like that, surely that status quo position is incredibly extreme. 
And then once you sort of, you know, have the conversation on those grounds, actually things like a Green New Deal really seem like quite a sensible course of action. You know, do you want your children and your grandchildren to be able to, 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 to live <laughs> to, and, to live, and to live well and to live with dignity? So, um, yeah, kind of like change, challenging that, the parameters of the conversation about what's radical and, um, and, and what's actually common sense, I think, is, um, is, is really key. There's another, there's another element uh, to this, uh, and, and Marinella, you spoke earlier about, <clears throat> about class um, and class mm -hmm. struggle elections. So a comment from Derek O'Keefe, um, who's a writer, uh, thinker and organizer in Vancouver, um, who has been involved in a number of insurgent campaigns. And Derek just wrote, we did two years of insurgent left municipal campaigns in Vancouver, managed to elect a far left city councillor, Gene Swanson. One key thing, that I haven't seen even in this recent NDP federal campaign was the use of creative and confrontational tactics to get media attention for left politics. So in Vancouver, in the Gene Swanson campaign, they, they had a mansion tax uh, demand and they marched on the biggest mansion in Vancouver owned by a billionaire, Chip Wilson, presented him with a, with a big tax assessment showing how much he would have to pay if there was a mansion tax. And Derek's asking, why haven't we seen more specific naming and shaming of the wealthiest people in Canada? Um, I'm, I'm a fan of it. I was on a talk show on the, the big private network with Doug Ford before he was Premier of Ontario. And I was talking about Galen Weston and, and David Thompson, two billionaires who control as much wealth as a third of all Canadians, it's just saying we have to take some of their money away. And it's illegitimate. It's been made by workers and it needs to be redistributed. And that's, it's controversial and it's, you know, kind of, you're, you're tweaking the nose of the, of, of the establishment when you do it. What do you guys think of those kind of tactics? Any, any of you, including Matthew, who, I don't know, you seem more genteel in your political, cultural approach. Um, but the naming and shaming tactic. I think who's genteel? Great. Hold on, let's, uh, I need a point of clarification. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been on the front lines with neo-Nazis in Hamilton. Well, I, I saw that. Guy. Yeah. Who's more genteel? So the question is like, you know, for what what used to be considered big bold ideas i remember this guy that i met at this conference a few years back who had this really radical idea of clean air and clean water and clean and clean land and they they pitched this thing called the leap manifesto and as a city councilor i'm like well shit, that's pretty basic i could take that back and i'm proud to say that as a city councilor i introduced the first environmental bill of rights the blue dot motion in a steel city the first in ontario to move it uh, because we did offer a compelling alternative. When you put the Matt, Matt was away, also Facebook Live interviewing me while I was still explaining the Leap Manifesto to him for yes. the first time. So the convergence of the me, the live media opportunity and the ideas is, is real for you. And I did that with, with, I did that this week with 350, you know, because yeah. the point is we could be our own media now. And that's what's beautiful. And so, you know, I think the juxtaposition talking about when I'm on the doors, a 1% wealth tax on the ultra wealthy in Canada is pithy. It's like, it's, it's, it's paltry. It's like we could be more bold, but we tested. And I can tell you on the doors, when you talk about people who have wealth of over $20 million, when you talk about the 87 wealthiest people in this country, having more wealth than the 12 million uh, uh, lowest income earners in the country and that their average wealth went up $807 million in four years, people get very clear about the profound economic income inequality in this country. Mm -hmm. So in terms of naming and shaming, absolutely. Diversity of tactics, for sure. We're losing a culture war right now. We're losing the meme economy to Ontario proud, to Canada proud, the, the Manning Institutes and the big developers who are online building these astral turf campaigns. Yeah, these the are big Facebook is, groups in Canada that, uh, that do smear um, anti-progressive smear and endless smear videos and they yeah you know. and and you know we can take that back now and so folks that are out there and you talked about Derek but certainly Christo and, and so many others are out there doing great work online that we can get earned media you know like it like it can happen through social in ways that we can't buy we can't do ad buys we're not mm -hmm. going to compete with liberals and conservatives on multi-million dollar mainstream media campaigns. But I can in 28 days get a million reach on Twitter with, uh, with, you know, with 16,000 followers, which is not, the scale is much bigger than my actual following, mm -hmm. but that's where we're at. 
And so, you know, I think it's going to be a war of attrition and it's going to take, uh, you know, this idea of a green new deal. I mean, respectfully, if you look at our platform, we might not have branded it well, the new deal for the people for fear of, of confusing the electorate around using the word green when there's a green party also running. You can't do that. I mean, my last name is green. So I had a hard <laughs> enough time as it is making sure folks didn't vote for the wrong party. Right. So I appreciate the brand, the bandwidth that people have in their brains. Um, but I don't see any strategic reason why we would retreat from the progressive ground that we've gained. In fact, in this minority, there is a huge opportunity extra parliamentary to put profound pressure on ridings like across the country. There's gonna be by-elections, mark my word. We're gonna be, you know, two, uh, 24 months uh, tops, I think in this, in this election before we're into it again. So borrowing from our comrades in the States, we need to be in a perpetual election cycle Knocking on doors, signing petitions, you know, taking over city councils and school board trustees. All of that stuff matters because it trains us in the hard skills to take on the big bull questions federally. Emma, you guys at Momentum UK declared a permanent election campaign the day after the last election in 2017, <laughs> didn't you? Or something like that a few days later? Yeah. How's yeah. that been for you? <laughs> Honestly. Honestly. So... So when the, there was this surprise result, we, the Labour Party did much, much better than expected. Uh, and it, it, we felt at that time that the, the government, the parliament was going to have, was going to live for, you know, weeks, maybe a couple of months. So we declared ourselves on permanent election footing. <laughs> and then that sort of day after, it was like, we have to work out what this now means. <laughs> We're all tired. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, but we now, as of yesterday, we are now finally two years on back in, back in election mode. Uh, but you know, I think, I think, you know, what Matthew was just saying is, is absolutely right. And it doesn't, that, that synergy between the community organizing and like, that's a real thing in and of its own right. And, but it has that, it can have that relationship also with electoral politics. And obviously there's, stuff that you need to be careful around right and it, it, this yeah so there's like and what? that's whether can you name that well it has to be i had this great experience right where uh, an amazing organizer who came in at the same time as me on jeremy's first campaign uh young woman called faduma uh, like originally from somalia came to the uk as a refugee also a former teacher just all-round hero she's now on city council uh, and she, uh, me and her, I went out on her round door knocking and we spoke to this amazing woman uh, who, and Faduma was going around and, and collecting stories from people who were having problems in their houses, in this oh, particular wow. housing estate, because she'd, she'd had lots of complaints. So she was going around and proactively finding out if other residents were also having these particular concerns. And this woman was just so surprised that, that this that Faduma, her counsellor, was coming round and knocking on her door, and she said, "Hang on a minute, are you here to get elected?" And Faduma said, "I've got a four-year term, and I was elected three months ago, so I do, but it's not for almost four years." And this woman was she just like bowled over, and like that's the type of relationship that we need to be. You know, our leaders need to be organisers, and you know that's where we that's where it works well. That's where it, that's how it should be. Hmm that kind of last ditch attempt to like quickly, you know, do a, a, a listening campaign, you know, two months before an election. Right. People are smart. It doesn't mean that. anything. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. People know it's, it's bullshit, basically. We are uh, rapidly coming to the end of the hour. Um, and this conversation feels uh, like it has legs. Um, but I want to, I want to touch on something and give you all a chance to respond to it. Um, so there is an argument within movement worlds, broadly defined, that electoralism is a trap. And there's lots of people who feel it, and I, I never argue against that because I, I've, I've felt it myself. And I think right now is a moment when people who work in community organizing and, and on lots of different issues are drawn to the electoral. I think the climate clock has shoved people into an engagement with the notion of taking power and, and the fact that we no longer have the luxury to stand aloof from that dirty process. Um, but there's still a legitimate point of view that, you know, and, and, it, and it still does happen. People work their hearts out on campaigns, even for good candidates. Those candidates win or they don't. And the parties don't really have any interest in maintaining the way movements and organizations at the base do 
maintaining contact and, and, and energy with their base. And people feel abandoned, they feel burned out, they feel neglected, they feel used. And so there, there are still traps in getting involved in electoralism. And I'd love to hear from all three of you um, how you feel they can be avoided, whether they can be avoided, you know, honestly, very candidly, whether there, that is a kind of a side effect of this engagement, which is inevitable, or, or what you say to those people, the comrades who, who genuinely feel that. Marinella, I know, I know you've encountered this in the left in Chicago. So what do, what do you say? Yeah, so I think electoralism, you know, the thought that you can just, we can just make change by just electing the right people, that is a trap. Yeah. Um, and so I, th I think we, um, what we're doing in DSA, and I think what it sounds like, I mean, from this conversation is, um, and what others are doing, um, is that we, we need to kind of use elections and use electoral work as a tool to build our movements. So it's just one more part of, of what we're doing to build our movements. And we need to also ensure that our movements are healthy and that we have a depth of organization outside of electoral work. So again, like doing issue-based work, um, I think is really, really, really important. And also making sure that we are not, you know, kind of building that depth for nothing and that we are actually um, using that depth both to leverage our power, but also to find candidates that are truly going to come out of movements and who are going to really feel like that is their political home and not like, you know, in our case, like the Democratic Party is their political home and therefore they have this kind of fraught relationship with, with the movements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's totally legitimate. Uh, it's a totally legitimate concern. And I think a lot of what we're doing in DSA is um, building an entirely new way to engage in electoral work. Um, that is indeed about kind of naming the enemy and not being afraid to take political risks and also um, really using campaigns and then also, you know, hopefully our electeds using their office to, as Emma was saying, to organize um, and not just to legislate. Matthew, thank you for that, Marinella. That was awesome. Where, where are you going with the question again? The electoral trap. It, it's the, the yeah, question. I mean, like, it's, it's not like for everybody. In Hamilton, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's not for everybody. I saw particularly my communities being vastly unrepresented, not under, but unrepresented on the left and leftist issues. It's been the case that for us, a lot of new folks that have come to Canada have felt an allegiance to liberals and the old Trudeau. And we were okay with being in proximity to power you know, we were used as old school power brokers of communities uh, across yeah. all of our diverse communities. And now this next generation is like, we're done with that. We're not, we're not satisfied to have our elected officials come to our dinners and give them these bullshit awards. It's like, no, we're claiming our power and we're claiming our seats at the table and we're not waiting for, you know, establishments to tap us on the shoulders and say that it's going to be okay. And that they're gonna that we're gonna be the choice necessarily. So one of the things that I found in learning from um, you know what what is happening down in the states is that people are challenging primaries in the way that we need to challenge nominations, yeah. so that when establishment candidates uh, come, that might not actually reflect because we got a bad habit of parachuting people that might not actually reflect community that we have strong enough extra parliamentary movements that can support. Joel Harding is a great example of that in, in Ottawa, right? Like that guy is going to disrupt the legislature. We saw like Leah Gazan is coming from deep community, uh, you know, and like there were some really compelling candidates in the NDP, some who didn't quite make it because the runway wasn't long enough for them to take off. But I guarantee you if they stick to it in this next cycle, we're going to see some incredible people elected, but it's not for everybody. And that's okay too. Yeah. Um, as long as we can get clear about what our shared values are and where we can be in solidarity. Like I found I was at my best as a city councilor when I was championing, not co-opting, not taking credit for an attribution, but championing community initiatives, mm -hmm. whether it was taking on payday loans or the blue dot motion with the folks and, you know, taking on uh, uh, tenants rights with acorn. It was always working with community. That's where power is. Right. And that's what we miss sometimes. Um, that's good. I'm sort of hearing a, a, a kind of latent, don't become a party cultist, you know, like the parties have this cult-like uh, uh, culture 
where it's, it just becomes all about the party. And that, that, ish, that energy only goes upwards to people who are controlling structures. And that rootedness feels like a really, a really needed uh, gravity to, to, to counteract. And like, yeah, my I, people won't let that happen. So that's right, not yeah. a thing. You know, they're going to they're call me in. They're going to check me in a minute. So I know that to be true. And I don't have to necessarily worry about that before, the, you know, before they come for me. That's, that's, that's it. You know, to have relationship baked in. When, when Matthew and I met at that Progress Summit uh, uh, four years ago, um, you brought a busload of young people from, from, uh, from Hamilton to this conference in Ottawa. And as soon as the Hamilton mob, you know, charged into the place, the average age dropped and the diversity of the conference exploded by virtue of the people that you arrived with. And every session that had those people was, was way more electric just from having like real people in the room. Um, so that disrupt, that is a disrupt, community is a disruptive force. Um, and, and it's a, and it's a lifelong uh, relationship. Emma? Do you, in Momentum UK, even think about this thing of the electoral being uh, uh, not for everyone anymore, or are you are you guys all in now? Given that you have a leader and you have yeah. had a major impact on the party, and you've proven that you can be a sustained force, which has shifted its direction and its and its culture, not changed it completely, but really. Yeah, through. I mean, it it definitely does. Yeah, there's definitely definitely still work to do, and. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with Matthew's point about it not necessarily being for everyone. And actually the the strength of the insider outsider the insider outsider strategy only works when there's actually a real outsider bit. And I think that at different points over the last four years, too much of our collective energy has gone towards the party and we feel it. And actually we feel weaker. And so therefore that you do need some of that outside stuff as well. But that that it it has you have you have to have both. And mm-hmm. that kind of brings me back to the most fundamental point for me is that to change society in the way that we need to change society, right? We need, we need everybody. We need everybody to get involved. And like, so therefore there doesn't have to be, there's never going to be one plan that, you know, one narrow plan that everybody gets on board with. There does have to be some kind of diversity of tactics and that sense of ecology and ecosystem. However, you know, with the, with the caveat, that if that's too dispersed and those bits aren't talking to each other and there isn't that kind of shared sense of alignment and vision, you know, then it's, we're not benefiting from being greater than the sum of our parts either. Um, but yeah, so I think, I definitely think that we can't, steer completely clear of elections in my view because if we create that void it's filled by all of the wrong people and that's where we need we need to take that power we basically need to take over the parties and make you know that that which is essentially what we've been trying to do at momentum for the last couple of years right we have to bring the movement people in to take over the institutions but in order to do that we also need to be organizing more people and continually bringing new people into the fold so that the forces on the outside keep the people on the inside alive. So if it's a zero sum game and everybody goes inside, there's nobody outside. It actually has to be, yeah, it has to yeah. be continually renewed. That's exactly. a tremendous challenge. And a new thought uh, for me um, in this moment, um, really, really helpful. I was at a panel uh, event in Philadelphia last night um, and a fellow named Maurice Mitchell, who's the head of the Working Families Party, another left configuration in American politics, which sort of works beside, sometimes with, sometimes within the Democratic Party, said that this moment of life on earth, of the climate crisis, of rising uh, authoritarianism and white supremacy and everything else has uh, radicalized liberals. And that's small L for those of us in Canada who have a big liberal party, but many people who vote liberal really are being radicalized by the material conditions of this, of this epic moment, but it's also electoralizing radicals. Um, and, and that sort of strikes me as the, that was the frame for this conversation. Um, I know lots of people in the chat were kind of hoping for a post-election, what do we do next? Very concrete Canadian conversation. We framed this intentionally as a broader conversation to try to draw on some wisdom inside and outside of this particular nation state called Canada. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you for, for sharing 
this wisdom. I found it a really stimulating conversation. Give me lots to think about. The chat is still overflowing. And um, I think what we could do, because there were so many thoughtful questions, we simply cannot answer them all, but we can share them with you. So we'll pass on all the questions and thoughts from the chat and even from people who sent in stuff before for you folks to think about. Emma, you're going to the general election. You'll have tons of spare time. Um, <laughs> Matthew, you're a new member of parliament. If it, probably they have six, seven hours a day. That's just like free time. So you guys will have plenty of time to, to deal with it. But thank you again. And uh, let's keep this conversation going. We'll bug you again for something else. Don't you worry. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.